By the time orders from Jinto Station, along with the Coast Guard Cutter 3009, were being issued to the patrol boat to quote, get in there and rescue the survivors, the ferry was essentially rolling over, soon to be completely inverted, rendering entry into the vessel effectively impossible by this point. The roughly 1 hour and 22 minute window of opportunity to rescue every single passenger on board, from the first sign of emergency to the point of impossible entry or exit of the stricken vessel, this golden hour was, without a doubt, almost completely wasted by personnel whose duty is to those under their charge. We live our lives day in and day out taking these individuals for granted, because in most situations around the world, the Coast Guard, EMTs, firefighters, rescue personnel of all types, hell, even mariners simply helping their fellow mariner, they have a reputation we can largely rely upon, for good reason. For the 10th grade class from Dan Juan High School on April 16th, it would be the complete opposite. In the first few years of investigation, there was much doubt and conspiracy theories thrown about, not completely without merit, of course, in a situation like this, but many found it unbelievable for the ferry to roll so severely under these circumstances. Also unbelievable at first, and what would come to light later, though, is just how pathetically incompetent owner and operator Chong Hai Jin Marine were as a company. In the previous episode, we saw how the poorly maintained ballast system improper haphazard modifications, raised center of gravity, absence of lashings and massively overloaded cargo, led to a shift and point of no return that would be seemingly unreasonable in an ocean-going vessel of this size, under normal circumstances. It cannot be overstated, these weren't normal circumstances. As the vessel was reaching a dangerous list, the captain ordered one of his officers to initiate the anti-healing pumps, Pumps that effectively move the water around to the desired area of the hull in hopes to ride a ship and correct its list. These pumps were found to be inoperable, not that they had lost power or due to the vessel's list, but because they had been so poorly maintained for so long. More importantly, they're a part of, or at least adjacent to, the same system that controls ballast water coming in, going out, and between tanks in general. If this system had been maintained similar to the anti-healing system, the ballast tanks in the hull wouldn't have just been kept at a level too low to maintain stability, it's likely the whole system had not been utilized or tended to at all. And all this while the ship was routinely overloaded with unsecured cargo. Conflicting reports state though, that Chong Hai Jin intentionally blew out what they felt was excessive ballast water regularly, in attempts to make it possible for overloading, the load lines appearing at proper levels upon leaving port. Either way, all of these conditions, especially with this particular ferry's modifications raising the center of gravity, meant it was the most susceptible to capsizing of any ship in the Chong Hai Jin fleet, as the company hadn't modified its other vessels in this particularly egregious way, only the seawall. Lasting this long only due to the relatively calm seas along the coast, which likely lulled companies like these into a sense of complacency. 
Those in shipping in this area, familiar with these ferries and routes, knowing full well Chang Haijin saw these vessels as little more than cargo ships. Cargo to and from Jeju being the most profitable, begrudgingly allowing passengers to tag along, accounting for roughly 25% of the revenue on each voyage. The modifications after all hadn't been performed to simply add passenger capacity. They expanded cargo capacity. The repurposed decking, adding 65 plus more spaces for passenger vehicles, roughly 58 of which having no tie-downs, built into the deck for strap positions, meant these vehicles raising the center of gravity couldn't have been lashed down even if the crew intended to. Yet another portion of the modifications, the KR, or Korean Registry of Shipping, simply signed off on in their inspection, for one reason or another. In addition, in 2017, several quote black box type recording devices finally recovered from the huge number of vehicles carried inside the ferry, combination dash cam, mic, and G4 sensors. These units frequently equipped on vehicles in Korea, captured recordings of events from being loaded and parked all the way up to rollover when the vehicles became inverted or otherwise crushed. Crucially, the G4 sensors revealing they detected no readings of forces exceeding normal sea travel various motion of light waves until the vehicles themselves began to slide after the list had worsened, well after the abrupt turning inputs were made that caused the list. The G-force is concurrent with vehicles sliding and impacting one another at this point. There were no G-forces found prior to this listing condition that would suggest an impact, explosion, or collision of any kind. An external impact of the magnitude theorized by some, the ferry being rammed in the lower port bow, or colliding with an underwater obstruction, knocking it off course initially, leading to the subsequent port side list. An impact of this magnitude would have exerted massive G-forces onto these sensitive devices. The investigative and pivotal journalist group New Stoppa broke this G-force sensor story in 2017, a very unique news outlet in Korea, one that stood on their own when the large majority of media simply parroted the South Korean government's cover-up of the botched rescue in the immediate aftermath. New Stoppa continuing to stand alongside the parents all along the way, helping to amplify their voices and seek justice in an atmosphere where the Blue House, Korea's government leaders were overtly making attempts to silence dissenting opinion by threat of force, legal persecution, or both, especially journalists. The tragedy of this ferry exposing the larger issues rooted deep in South Korean media, government, and the pivotal role genuine investigative journalism plays in our modern society something we'll delve into in detail later in this video. At roughly 9 a.m., Jeju Coast Guard dispatched rescue helicopter B-513 and Mokpo Coast Guard units dispatched helicopters B-511 and B-512. Mokpo Coast Guard patrol vessel 123 was dispatched around this same time. The first helicopter on scene by 927, the patrol vessel 123 by 930, and the other two helicopters by 932 and 945. As we saw in part one though, none of which in communication with one another. Yet of the many failures in communication, perhaps the most egregious stemmed from decisions made just prior to those poor communications to begin with. See, the commanding officer of Mokpo Coast Guard Group, the highest ranking officer in the general area, was currently aboard the 3,000 ton cutter 3009, anchored some 70 miles away. The average top speed of a cutter this size being 25 plus knots, would put this cutter at roughly two and a half hours away. And thus, at this time, the Mokpo Group Cutter would dispatch its helicopter, number B-512, intended to be the command unit on scene, and under normal circumstances, would carry the high-ranking commander so that he could coordinate rescue efforts with eyes directly on scene immediately. However, this commander felt he was too tired from the cutter's mission that previous night, guiding foreign fishing boats through Korean waters. He felt his fatigue and the helicopter's loud noise would prevent him from properly performing these duties, thus dispatching helicopter B-512 from the cutter without climbing aboard, also deciding not to get cutter 3009 immediately underway toward the scene either, expecting to coordinate efforts remotely. Without the situation's default commander, this would then lead to further complications and confusion in chain of command. Add to this, Mokpo Coast Guard Command Center had started a social media messenger group and began inviting all Coast Guard units to the chat, except for Jindo Station. Jindo Station being one of the few that had communicated directly with Chong Haijin crew aboard the stricken ferry. And this online chat group made instead of any sort of unified radio frequencies. 
Once Patrol Vessel 123 arrived on the scene, its captain was given de facto command over the rescue, a decision made by the highest ranking officers of Korea's Coast Guard. This decision overriding the Mokpo commander aboard the cutter, and from what I can gather, also without his awareness. Regardless, whoever was quote, assigned the role of commander would matter little anyhow. Just prior though, Helicopter B-512 was designated as the command unit. Arriving soon along with the other two rescue aircraft, it was not in communication with any units on scene though, and would instead become the direct line of communication to the Blue House, Korea's government leaders, simply loitering in the area and watching, not aiding in rescue efforts. The two other helicopters immediately attempting to rescue those on the ship's still exposed starboard side, rescuing a handful of survivors, they were only in communication with each other, or their respective stations, Mokpo and Jeju, coordinating with no other units on scene. Patrol Vessel 123, after two to three unsuccessful attempts to contact the bridge of the seawall, the ferry's crew, now only in contact with their corporate offices and Jindo Station, would approach the vessel and rescue a handful of survivors directly onto the patrol vessel's bow. The ferry's captain and handful of other officers with him, out of uniform in an effort to hide his identity, as the patrol vessel indeed didn't immediately recognize him in their rush to bring this group aboard. Captain Lee intentionally passing himself off as a normal passenger. At this point, there would be no one else aboard the ferry's bridge to communicate with vessel 123. Captain Lee's identity effectively unknown still, he had no intention of passing along any pertinent info about passengers still aboard either. Meanwhile, a Coast Guard crewman deployed a life raft or two amid the hasty rescue with the patrol boat. The life rafts would simply float nearby unused, the patrol vessel's crew refusing to penetrate any further into the stricken ferry, refusing to use their loudspeaker to blast out abandoned ship orders towards the ferry, and effectively keeping their distance well before a complete rollover ensued only sending their inflatable once more to aid in the cluster of small boats scrambling in those final moments. But again, crucial moments quickly passing to enter the vessel and verify all souls were accounted for. Jindo Station did have the crucial information that more than 400 total were on board and quote unable to move, communicated to them via one of the ferry's officers, but remained unable to reach any Coast Guard units on scene. Prior to their escape, the Chonghai Jin personnel aboard the ferry, in contact with Jindo Station, Ignoring their orders to sound evacuation alarms, too preoccupied with numerous calls to company headquarters, and soon after, quickly following the captain anyway to get themselves to safety as the patrol vessel approached. Since Jindo Station was possibly the only external contact still trying to communicate that survivors were left on board by this point, the two helicopters, in contact with their own stations, Helicopter B-512 with the Blue House and Cutter 3009, Patrol Vessel 123, in contact only with civilian vessels on scene and Mokpo Station, ignoring or otherwise neglecting that Mokpo did relay the information about trapped survivors early on, meant all units in this literal golden hour, the window that rescue could be realistically carried out with minimal risk before the ship was inverted, they would all plead ignorance to the situation inside the ferry's compartments later on. Rather than admitting their own cowardice, preventing them from venturing into the vessel while still able, under reasonable expectations, Coast Guard crews would typically account for how many survivors are in the water, still aboard, have been rescued, and so on. Losing track of all this while on scene, with a stricken vessel well known to routinely carry hundreds on board, is grossly negligent to say the least, a prison-worthy criminal act of inhumane, selfish cowardice in my view. <laughs> Regardless of all this, the first point of an evacuation is mustering, or moving all souls aboard to evacuation points. With their numbers then accounted for, making use of life rafts, flotation devices, or at the very least, remaining atop and visible while the vessel still floats for as long as possible until help arrives. Given the seawall did at least have flotation devices, functional life rafts, 
evidenced by Coast Guard crewmen deploying them, an unused raft still floating nearby, and numerous vessels of various sizes ready and able on scene within the first 30 minutes. The likelihood all souls aboard would have survived was extremely high. The captain of the Dula Ace, an oil tanker on scene from the beginning, stating he could tell by the radio calls only the inexperienced officers were those attempting any kind of coordination, not the ferry's captain himself. This person was inexperienced, says Moon. In an emergency, it should be the captain on the radio. You need to make decisions fast. If there was a golden hour for rescue, this window from roughly 8.50 a.m. to 10.10 a.m. was it. But Korea's Blue House, a voice on the phone directly representing the president and prime minister's interests, wasn't concerned with the rescue itself. Communicating throughout via helicopter B-512, the government official on the line was more concerned with the appearance of a proper rescue and how it would look on television. President Park herself remained unreachable for upwards of seven hours throughout this process, with the help of her aides after the fact, fabricating a story and schedule of being on, quote, official duties while the incident unfolded that day, Park finally appearing to make a statement from the Blue House at approximately 5.35 p.m. The ship fully capsized and hundreds still accounted for by 10.30 a.m., the actions of these would-be leaders, these cowards, would go from horrible to levels of inhumane that remain to this day difficult to comprehend and still largely unresolved. As you're probably aware by now, the children aboard had smartphones. It was 2014 after all. Most passengers had a cell phone for that matter. And with working cell service, the vessel not straying far from the coast and its voyage to Jeju. Hundreds of passengers were in constant contact with loved ones via texts, photo and video messages, phone calls, and voicemails. There was no shortage of real-time updates going out to many concerned parties throughout Korea. However, the Korean government would begin manipulating the quote, official story immediately, even as the situation unfolded. The ferry in this inverted position with the bow visible would indeed, unfortunately, be in a position no one could enter, not even divers, as there would be no way to know if or when it would finish sinking to the sea floor. The water is approximately 44 meters or 140 feet deep in this area. The only viable option prior to being fully submerged would be the task of pumping air into the capsized vessel in an effort to improve its buoyancy and eventually allow for entry and rescue. However, without experts involved, this could put the survivors at further risk of asphyxiation via contaminated air. Not an impossible solution though if you have the right specialists and equipment. Crucially, air pockets in capsized vessels are a verifiable phenomenon, and there are records of survivors found in sunken vessels that have come to rest on the sea floor, alive, in waters at or near these depths, upwards of 60 hours later, with many experts agreeing up to 72 hours being possible. Now, due to depressurization needs and once the vessel is stable enough to enter, these rescue conditions are extremely precarious, even for the most experienced rescue divers. Not only would a vessel like this be a dangerous overhead environment, but initially finding survivors would be a monumental task, not to mention exfiltration from that same environment with survivors in tow, along with the need for an on-site decompression chamber to bring the survivors into immediately before they can surface. With that said though, while highly difficult and requiring specialists, this is not an impossibility either, and its practice, at least by professionals experienced in saturation, confined space diving takes place more often than you might think. Otherwise, diving in a situation like this without such experts, precautions or resources available is often a death sentence itself. Families took it upon themselves to gather on Jindo Island later that day in an impromptu facility that was a purported meeting point set up by the government for quote, those that had been rescued. The quote, official narrative being parroted by many Korean media outlets now, and authorities scrambling to maintain it. This wouldn't just be construed in the news, but also in person, to those parents and loved ones who had quickly gathered midday in that Jindo gymnasium. Officials getting up on stage making announcements, posting official-looking lists of children's names, falsified to look as though they were accounted for, and even reassuring parents, friends, and family members, person to person, that their lost loved ones were either already rescued, still on their way, in the process of being rescued, or otherwise not to worry because they were all doing their best. 
unbelievably as families and loved ones began challenging these so-called authority figures. These officials were actually surprised at how up-to-date the parents' information was. By this point, it's easy to see how callous and uncaring these suits were, but this also revealed just how truly out of touch they were with reality in general. Sure, they were pretending to have the situation in hand for whatever reason, save face, inconsiderate, etc., but it seemed as though they were truly surprised that people, with cell phones, had up-to-date real-time information. The higher-ups in Korean government completely delusional in buying into their own story they believed was somehow preserved, when in fact, dozens of civilians were on site in plain view, attempting rescue right in the face of the Coast Guard, not to mention all the communication with loved ones from passengers. As this was taking place, the atmosphere in the gym understandably intensified. Coast Guard Cutter 3009 and that high-ranking commander who'd been too tired to embark earlier finally arrived on scene mid-afternoon. There had also been a handful of Korean Navy vessels that arrived within the first few hours but kept their distance, deferring to the Coast Guard, presumably. In the meantime, contrary to the downright insidious attempts to convince the Korean public that everyone had been rescued, there were some attempts, more like platitudes, quietly being made by officials to weigh their options as the vessel remained just barely buoyant. Plans like floating the vessel with air pumped in via hoses, actually sending divers down to search, word of these plans, albeit not actually taken seriously by those entertaining them, would in one way or another reach the families at the rescue center, the loved ones understandably reaching for hope in any way they could. Many civilian divers taking the initiative to get involved however they could once they'd received word of this debacle, others less convinced to get involved due to the spread of misinformation across major media outlets. A civilian diver who was adamant in getting involved was brought aboard Cutter 3009 to speak for their group for a quote, planning meeting in this regard, speaking later to New Stapa under condition of anonymity for the safety of he and his family. 해경이 구조에 참여하기 위해 온 민간 다이버들을 데려간 곳은 해경 3009호 지휘함이었다. 그때가 한 4시 오후 4시 정도 갔을 거 봐요. 그러니까 친구들은 막 연락이 했을 거 아닙니까? 여기 여기. 막 들키는 말이야. 어, 저기 오셨네. 어디서 왔어요? 아, 친구 만났어. 아, 어디서 왔어? 그러면서 막. 그때 해군 조수탑까지 있었고. 네. 청장, 때 청장. 네. <목소리도> 네. <목소리도> 네. 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 And any other professional rescue divers or recovery firms as well. Authorities then began to give the impression that either survivors or otherwise recovered victims were being brought to Pengmok Harbor, just a couple hours bus ride to the southwest on Jindo Island. It's thought this was a stall tactic by the government, not expecting desperate families and parents to follow up. Surprised once again that many immediately went to the harbor to seek answers. At Pengmok Harbor, there were no officials, no lost loved ones waiting to be reunited, nothing, just the media who had arrived quickly in full force as well, filming the suffering families like they were stars of some kind of reality show. Very few media members concerned with the actual matter at hand and children suffering in the Yellow Sea. So the families rented their own ride out there via fishing boats to see for themselves. To their horror, all of the government's excuses, rough waters, strong currents, and all their boasting about how many were actively searching, diving, rescuing, none of this was true. There were times of day, given no rough weather, that all conditions can reach a point where the water was like glass in this portion of the Yellow Sea. If there was a time that anything could be done, this would be another of those golden hours. The families had started coordinating their efforts by this point, remaining in close communication with one another as they became more spread out, investigating for themselves. Eventually, the Coast Guard would assign a vessel to bring family members out to the site later that night, or so they'd have the families believe. Once the vessel arrived, though, it was too crowded with state-influenced media, the operators of the vessel not allowing anyone else on board. There were, however, unbeknownst to the government, a handful of rogue journalists at Pengmok Harbor, whose goal was to get at the truth, damn the consequences. Parents and families kicked the state's media cronies off the vessel and started boarding, 
allowing only their most trusted journalists aboard. The family's already prepared to use their own devices to record as well. The next morning, the scene was swarming with even more vessels as the Korean government had brought in private contractor Undine Marine Industries Company. This empty gesture of, again, formulating a rescue plan was just that, empty, as all the politicians gathered on a vessel nearby, making it appear as though they were intending to float the ferry via pumped-in air or otherwise carry out some sort of rescue effort. They had no intention, though, of going through with any of this. To the frustration of everyone on site, in actuality, barring anyone but those in their circle from any real attempts, especially the civilian divers, ready to risk their lives and do whatever they could. The government only having someone pretend to dive and pinpoint the children's location inside. Later that second day, April 17th, many families had returned to the gymnasium where they could at least comfort each other. Prime Minister Chung, second only to Korea's president, arrived in the evening, but by this time, the few government officials that were there had been worsening the situation again, for hours. Nearing their breaking point right when the Prime Minister entered, the crowd turned on him, and he fled immediately. Soon after, President Park emerged publicly for the second time, this time visiting the gymnasium just after the Prime Minister was forced out. Park, surrounded by a massive entourage of politicians, security, and more importantly, the chief of the Coast Guard, Kim seok Goon. At this point, the Korean people still had some hope that if anyone could do something, it would be the president herself. Unfortunately, they were gravely mistaken. The chief Kim and President Park calmly reciting the same false narrative. The family seemingly in stunned belief at how this abysmal excuse for leadership appeared right before their eyes to now go all the way to the very top. And numbers of those rescued still on board, unaccounted for, and even souls lost being reported by government officials and state influence media all varying wildly from one report to the next. On April 18th, day three, morning broke and the Korean government had decided that Undin, the one company they'd allowed to take part in any capacity, should bring in their old compressor units and fill the vessel with air. At 9 a.m., Undine showed up with this old compressor, but this was in no way an undertaking such a company had any experience with, let alone the proper equipment. The units were old, just some gas-powered industrial air compressors that, if used, likely would have put any survivors at risk of asphyxiation. And any sort of company or nation with the capability to perform this sort of task properly, or bring someone in who could, with the proper equipment, remained turned away by the Korean government. The Republic of Korea allowing the U.S. Navy to provide search assistance via aircraft only. The USS Bonhomme Richard on scene since the ferry capsized. Assistance from the rescue helicopters turned away the day of and since, kept their distance throughout the ordeal. The Bonhomme Richard, being a WASP-class light aircraft carrier, carries multiple air and watercraft capable of rescue, many men and women on board mobilizing immediately prior to being turned away. These aircraft now just loitering in the area, providing aid and search only, which is why we have many of these scenes you're seeing here. But officials would relay the news of this compressor being on scene and the Coast Guard now filling the vessel with air, as if they'd actually started this monumental task properly, igniting hopes once again, which simply wasn't the case, and these disgraceful officials knew it. Three hours later, during the supposed air pumping process, the ferry disappeared below the waves, sinking completely. At this point, of the 476 on board, 172 had been rescued, 3 of the 14 teachers, 75 of the 325 students, and 22 of the 33 crew members, leaving 304 total unaccounted for. Again, the chances are likely there were still air pockets trapped in the ship and survivors within them, many experts agreeing 72 hours would be the approximate length of survival in such a situation. If an air pocket is stabilized, the survivors are then at risk of hypothermia, dehydration, or asphyxiation due to CO2 buildup. The ability to stay warm, illumination of any kind, drinking water, and a place to remain completely dry, ranging from extremely difficult to impossible to find as time wears on. There are many stories of bravery and heroics amongst the overwhelming cowardice, bravery amongst some crew members who stood up for these passengers, amongst school teachers, and of course, 
all the students themselves will forever be the heroes that shine the brightest in this story. Later in the day, the Coast Guard finally started to concede in incremental steps, effectively handing off rescue and recovery efforts to Undine, stating the private sector surpassed their capabilities, which in this instance was a very low bar considering the Korean Coast Guard and Navy had little to no training, equipment, or apparently interest in these specific tasks anyway. The Coast Guard admitting to this somewhat indirectly that same day as well, admitting that their only capability was open water scuba diving. Civilian divers were going to start doing what they could now, and no one would stop them. In fact, the Coast Guard, of course, taking credit for, quote, mobilizing them. With Undine more or less taking over the scene and civilian divers hard at work now, three bodies were recovered, the first since April 16th, the day of capsizing. However, despite being found and recovered by those brave civilian divers putting their own lives at risk, the Coast Guard would give the credit to the Undine Company. There was also much infighting between Undine and the Korean Coast Guard as time wore on. As the Korean government would concede more and more control over the scene, and the need for anyone who could dive became clear, more divers would start getting involved, Korean Navy divers, Undine, and the civilian divers making up the large majority. All at various levels of certification, with equipment of various condition. Now, at this depth, performing tasks like search and recovery of bodies is difficult enough an extremely dangerous situation, even for the most well-equipped professional divers. And without experienced professionals and their equipment who could perform depressurization and rescue, exfiltration of those potentially alive in air pockets, submerged for days now, realistically, was next to impossible. The 72-hour mark also having come and gone as well. This was made all the more complicated by eager teams of divers not unified in their organization. The area also swarming with surface vessels many just moving about randomly, of all kinds, by this time. And as updates from the situation were differing wildly from Korean media and official government updates non-existent to outside entities, search and rescue remained a legitimate task in the surrounding areas, the U.S. Navy continuing their search from the air. Tireless recovery efforts, some civilian divers working to the point of exhaustion, would continue through the weeks to follow, with the total victims recovered reaching 250 by late June. At this point, 11 children were still confirmed missing. Coast Guard officials and also Korea's Ministry of Ocean Fisheries were still more or less getting in the way the entire time, trying to create political red tape constantly for these divers to adhere to. On July 10th, the Coast Guard chief made an announcement. Hundin would be out and in their place, the company 88 Underwater Development would take over, a Korean company comprised of professional civilian divers with more advanced certifications using nitrox, more akin to saturation diving, allowing for more extended periods underwater, and thus more thorough search and discovery. But the Coast Guard officials on site seemed to push back even more, as if further embarrassed now, since they were completely untrained and unfamiliar with these more advanced diving methods. In addition to 88 underwater development, by July 11th, what was to be one of the biggest steps forward in this final search for the missing, ended up being one of the biggest slaps in the face to the families leading the charge on scene. The Korean Coast Guard finally yielding, forming an ambitious plan, quote unquote, in plain sight of the families of course, brought on extended duration dive team professionals from the US, one private group of professionals and their US Navy counterparts. The Coast Guard actually made a big show of this gesture. These team leads were brought aboard a Coast Guard command ship and then escorted out to assess the diving site itself. The dive team leaders fully prepared to take on this task. See, in the world of scuba, professional and saturation diving, amongst those who dive, professionally at least, safety is taken very seriously. It's the priority over everything else.
미국 잠수팀은 안전을 이유로 사고 해역에 바지선 철수를 요구하다가 받아들여지지 않자 철수를 결정했다. 정부가 새로 마련한 수색 구조 계획은 이렇게 엉성하게 시작됐다. 이스바지에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서에서
the search coming to an end. Families and their supporters now left only to plead for the recovery of the vessel in its entirety. And once again, President Park and her administration go silent about the matter. Nearing the one-year anniversary, the families and their supporters having never let up the fight for the truth and the need for closure on those still missing, President Park suddenly announces a plan to recover the ferry, a plan filled with ifs and, of course, a seeming lack of confidence. The government announced its intention to start surveying the area in preparation to lift the vessel, and the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries announcing they felt it's definitely possible. However, rather than bringing in experts right away to start the process, officials would use these, quote, ocean examinations as a stalling tactic, since they had no means and likely no intention to actually recover the vessel themselves to begin with, as recovery would no doubt require the help of an outside firm or nation and, of course, funding. Government officials then started publishing reasons why the vessel's recovery would be too expensive or a waste of resources and on and on. Even when asked directly, a high-level member of Congress doubled down on this rationale. This conclusion reached what, 12 months after the incident? Nustapa uncovered that seven or more firms specializing in exactly this type of vessel salvage had submitted their highly detailed proposals by April 30th of 2014, just two weeks after the incident itself. These proposals went completely ignored by the Park Administration and Coast Guard, but proof was found they'd actually been reviewed by the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries that following May, less than a month after the ferry sank, each company having submitted legitimate, professional tenders for project proposals to immediately salvage the vessel whenever requested. One of the exact same plans that a firm called TMC decided would be best was read word for word from the nearly year-old proposals read off at a press conference by the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries as if to be their idea and the idea they'd move forward with. The Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries official that came forward to New Stapa under condition of anonymity revealed this plan was not spoken of since its proposal the year before because the Republic of Korea wanted to avoid the raising of the vessel entirely, using, quote, data gathering and ocean evaluation as stall tactics. <laughs> A quote, Special Investigation Committee for the Seawall Ferry would be formed, comprised of government officials who were supposedly on the side of the families to get to the truth. And by late March 2015, the families attempted to take their protest directly to the Blue House. The ruling party and the Park Administration started a smear campaign aimed at taking down the newly formed Special Investigation Committee, or SIC. And soon, cracks started showing in the SIC itself, its own Vice Chairman Cho showing signs of overt corruption and misappropriation of funds. A week later, this Special Investigation Committee's primary and highest level members were withdrawn by Vice Chairman Cho. Those few honest members left, feeling powerless, and families enraged that yet again another platitude was disguised as an honest gesture. The family members would continue appealing to the humanity of these suits. Despite the humane reactions of some, these appeals were lost on the large majority of most. Their humanity lost long ago. (laughs) 
Those few honest members remaining, not under the influence of the ruling party, again, left powerless. And crucially, these stall tactics were used for one more important and nefarious reason. According to Korean law, the Protection of Communication Secrets Act requires government officials to preserve records of communication for only one year. By this point, mid-April of 2015, one year had elapsed from the sinking of the seawall, and more importantly, each passing day meant more and more government phone calls and communications in the immediate aftermath could be destroyed as well. This combined with the fact that as time passed, the vessel itself suffered more and more degradation at the bottom of the Yellow Sea. It's thought the Park Administration hoped this would also reach a point where evidence would be nearly impossible to deduce from the ferry once salvaged. And not surprisingly, one year on, it became clear to experts that Nustapa had interviewed regarding data and online trends, the ruling party was hoping that discussion of the topic in general would fade and pressure begin to subside. But the data proved the complete opposite amongst the Korean public, and the government's spin was becoming less and less effective on the entire populace now. In 2016, Park's corruption would begin to surface, running deep within South Korea's ruling Sainuri Party, the seawall tragedy raising major questions into her administration, and as more came to light, it became obvious the corruption, the embezzlement, Park's own personal dalliances, the interests of parties outside the government, influencing many administration decisions, a long story in itself. Much of this would lead to one of the largest and longest protests in Korea's history, the candlelight protests lasting from November 2016 to March 2017. Regardless of the media spin, this massive stand taken against Park's administration was inspired by and in memory of those lost in the ferry tragedy. Park's approval ratings falling in November of 2016, her personal relationship with Choi Soon Sil was exposed and proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. Choi, a major player in Korea's most corrupt chibols, those conglomerates of corporations working to control the government from behind the scenes, proven to have been pulling the president's strings all throughout her tenure, and later discovered that Choi had been the one sending corrupt officials after journalists for defamation of the Park administration, namely the Japanese journalist that exposed these anti-freedom of the press issues, and all with the blessing of Park, not like against her will or anything. When news finally came of a majority vote by lawmakers to impeach President Park, it was a moment of bittersweet victory. The vote taking place in December of 2016 and would be carried out in early March of 2017. Plans to raise the ferry would soon be enacted, mere weeks after Park's ouster. The firm chosen for this task would be Shanghai Salvage Company, a company out of China, specializing in such operations, and being from China, their equipment located not all that far away either. What the Park administration had done was blame the event in its entirety on Chong Hai Jin, the ferry's owner and operators. Not completely unfounded, these arrests were swift. Just three days after the incident, Captain Lee and those crew members who joined him leaving their fellow colleagues and passengers to die were quickly arrested. Although the prosecution requested the death penalty, the 70-year-old captain was given a life sentence and 14 of his complicit colleagues, sentences ranging from 18 months to 12 years each. The chairman of Chong Hai Jin Marine at the time, Yu Byung Un, a real piece of work himself, was the owner of the ferry and a man of great wealth, a long story on its own. This man would go into hiding upon receiving word of his arrest warrant in May of 2014, just weeks after the ferry sank. For a time, he was South Korea's most wanted fugitive, eventually found dead under highly suspicious circumstances in July of 2014, only being identified by his DNA as his body was so decomposed when discovered his clothing so unusual, and belongings not characteristic of such a businessman. Authorities first thought they'd found a homeless man. Three more of Yu's relatives also given jail sentences around the same time for embezzlement. The captain of patrol vessel 123, 57-year-old Kim Kyung-il, was sentenced to four years in prison in February of 2015. 
the inept Coast Guard was disbanded by vote of lawmakers in November of 2014, President Park transferring their duties in the meantime to the National Police and Department for National Safety. Remaining in this state until newly elected President Moon Jae-in revived the Coast Guard in July of 2017, technically operating under the supervision of the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries. In July of 2018, the Republic of Korea, for the first time, acknowledged the government was at fault for the tragedy of the Seawall Ferry. Although it meant little by this time, the families would receive approximately 200 million won, or $177,000, for each victim lost. Chief of the Coast Guard at the time of the ferry sinking, Kim Seok Kyun, one of those highest level officials blatantly lying directly to the families in the Jindo Gymnasium, amongst countless other related atrocities, was eventually acquitted of all charges, including negligent homicide, as recently as February 15, 2021. Former President Park would be arrested in March of 2017 after impeachment was carried out. Convicted of abuse of power, leaking government secrets, bribery, her 25-year sentence handed down in the summer of 2018 was then reduced to 20 years by an appeal in July of 2020. In December of 2021, Park received a pardon by sitting President Moon Jae-in and is currently free. Her imprisonment, a source of major division in Korea, with the right-wing conservative pro-Park groups denouncing Moon's administration for her imprisonment. It's reported Moon made this decision to pardon her in a bid to win over some of this opposition due to a current tight presidential race. Of the divers risking their lives, Kim Guan Hong was possibly the most outspoken. The nightmarish scenes these divers saw in the maze of wreckage, helping to pull bodies out for days, weeks on end, and then after the fact standing up to the inept government in solidarity with so many grieving parents. On June 17, 2016, Kim was found dead of apparent suicide at his home in Goyang. Kim was amongst many heroes that disaster produced, both on the day of and in the aftermath. 22-year-old Park Ji Young, a part-time Chong Hai-jin employee, an engaged couple Kim Ki-woon and Jung Hyun soon stayed on board, helping get victims to safety and provide them life jackets despite the stay-put orders, guiding some of those students to safety who actually were rescued and instead of joining them, continued going back to help more. Their remains found later, these heroes declared martyrs and buried in Korea's National Cemetery. The heroes, surviving victims, loved ones, the total people directly affected, numbering in the thousands, so many young lives were cut short. The massive undertaking of raising the ferry starting March 22 of 2017, the joint venture between Shanghai Salvage and ALE Lifting Company, was completed with the vessel being placed on the dock in Mokpo Harbor on Friday, March 31, 2017. This would allow the retrieval of much of the children's cell phone footage you see these days in videos, stored on these devices and recovered by forensic teams. The search of the vessel was declared finished more than a year later, on October 19, 2018, with five children still unaccounted for, but of course, all living on forever in the hearts of those who knew them. <laughs>